What did the One Piece live action do that was better than the anime or the manga? Well, when I asked all of you this question, the most common answer was nothing, 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 and of course, nothing, which I think is just a little bit harsh. There were a lot of things that I would say the live action did better, such as the drawings were way better. Like, I swear to God, some of them look like real people. Yeah, I have to say Toei's art department really stepped up for this adaptation. But for real, there are genuine things that the live action did better than the anime or the manga. First and foremost being Helmeppo. Now you might think that this is but a minor improvement. However, given that they elevate Helmeppo to the status of practically main character, I would say that this is a pretty colossal dub. As a longtime Helmeppo fan, I feel justified with the live action. And what they really nailed here is that yes, Helmeppo, he's a dick. And yes, that's why his hair looks like a dick. But also he's hilarious. Helmeppo sucks, he really sucks, but in a likable way. Because every time he does something horrible, it ends up coming back to bite him, which consistently keeps us full with serving after serving of delicious schadenfreude. So in the live action, I'm often like, go on Helmeppo, do it. You just do it and let's see what happens. And as the series goes on, he becomes just plain likable. Still a bit abrasive, but the dude has a heart and the friendship between he and Kobe is one of the greatest surprises that the live action had. The second thing the live action does better is Sanji's flirtatiousness. Because even when I first started One Piece back in high school at peak, teenage, Sanji simping was always more annoying than it was endearing to me. There are times when I've thought to myself, I wonder if Zoro would still be my favorite character if Sanji didn't have that particular trait. In that case, would Sanji be my favorite character? And the live action answers that. No, no, he wouldn't because come on now, this is Zoro after all. But I would like Sanji a hell of a lot more. And in the live action, I do think that he is the most generally likable straw hat because he's just a nice guy who cooks and kicks. He doesn't yell at the top of his lungs over stupid stuff and he doesn't get all lecherous at every given opportunity. But also his gag is still there in the live action because his more pared back flirting never works. And I think it's for the best because I do know a lot of people who genuinely don't like Sanji because of how, how shall we say, hands on he is. And really, I don't feel like we lost anything by cutting out that character trait. If anything, I think it enhances Sanji. And something that enhances the overall world as a whole is the bold AF maneuver that is the death of Mary. So death in one piece, I know this, you know this, I know it again. It's a bit of a joke. Death has gotten to the point where Echiro Oda himself in world acknowledges how ridiculous it is that characters survive. And I've made multiple videos now based solely on my gripes with fake out deaths. It barely, and I would say arguably doesn't work in the anime and the manga. So it 100% would not have worked in the live action. So I think that they made the right decision to actually kill Mary. Although I will say that One Piece live action had the opportunity to do something pretty funny because I half expected to see a shot at the end of Syrup Village where Mary climbs out out of the well, perhaps after some sort of heartfelt flashback of that time when his best sheep friend died and he had to carry on her, uh, her will of, what, what is it that Mary did in the live action? He was, he was Kai's lawyer, I think. The will of the law. But then here's a thing that didn't hit me until much later. If somehow we do make it to Water 7, this death is gonna pay off big time. By that time, not only will the going Mary be a solid crew member, but the idea of abandoning the ship is going to be even harder, considering that it's the last surviving legacy of someone who Usopp knew quite well. In the live action, Luffy even goes so far as to name the ship the Going Merry after Merry. Luffy did that. In the original series, Merry names it after himself, which is a bit more self-absorbed than any sheepman should be. But you're not just abandoning a ship. You're not just abandoning a crew member even. You're abandoning the memory of Merry himself. Because when does a man die? When he is forgotten. And when is a man forgotten? Well, that's when the captain of said man's self-styled sheep ship decides to trade it for a lion ship. It needs to be handled carefully, very carefully. But I think there's the potential for a lot of emotional weight here, especially if there's some flashbacks of like a young Usopp with Mary or something along those lines. And you know, something live action also did really well was downtime. You don't think about this too often because One Piece, it just doesn't give you the time to, but One Piece really doesn't have a lot of time to breathe. As a shonen battle manga, Oda is usually swiftly guiding us towards next battle or the next massive plot revelation. And post time skip, it's almost non-existent, but even pre time skip, we didn't get a lot of time with the straw hats just hanging out, which is one reason why I love the Long Ring Longland arc. It's one of, if not the only arc in the series, where the stakes are so comically low that we're allowed to just sit and enjoy the crew interactions. Out of necessity, One Piece live action had to take out a lot of the punch fighting and introduce a lot more of people talking, people talking in bars. There are so many bar scenes in this show, but a lot of them are really good. For example, I loved Zoro and Nami having their bonding moment in the bar, and Kobe and Helmeppo bond at the same bar later on, and even stuff like Garp eating a steak with Zeph, which by the way, an amazing meeting of legends here. Like 
everything with Garp. I do think it took a bit too much time. Three scenes of this, it's a lot, but the idea is really good. And these moments are very important for the live action because we're watching humans and they need to have human moments. Otherwise it's gonna make it much more difficult to connect with them. I wish we got more of the Straw Hats just talking and having fun in the actual One Piece. This is gonna be a bit controversial now, but I also don't mind getting rid of Gaimon. I love him and I especially love that Luffy canonically asked him to join the crew. I even love that he eventually got a girlfriend in a barrel named Sarfunkel, but I do think it was the right move not to include him. So I started One Piece with the anime, the four kids anime no less. And when this episode came around, I was like, oh, oh no. Is the One Piece just gonna turn into this slice of life problem of the week style show? Because it doesn't really fit. The Island of Rare Animals is a one chapter, one episode arc. It's more like what you would find in a gag manga with a short self-contained story. Short and self-contained also happens to describe Gaimon quite well aesthetically, but it's the only part of the manga that does actually feel like filler to me. And I think a lot of anime watches are surprised to learn that this actually happened. But my absolutely favorite thing that happened in the live action, and it is 100% superior in every way, was the bounty introductions of all of the pirates. This is something I legitimately think that the anime should shamelessly steal and implement. Every time one of these bounty introductions came up, it was so damn hype. It got to the point where I was actively anticipating characters showing up so that I could see what new creative way they found to interact with them and get the posters off screen. It was a fantastic way to adapt and even improve upon the classic Oda boxes and perfectly nailed the comic book vibe without being in any way cringe, which I think a lot of other comic booky attempts in the show were a little bit cringe, like the split screens and the close-ups for example. But with the bounties, mate, they just look stupidly cool. My one wish is that they take it a step further and find a way to do something like this with the Marines as well. When a famous Marine shows up, like say Smoker, it would be really cool to give them a similar introduction with their rank instead of the bounty number. Something like, hey, Smoker, he appears on screen. Then you see his name and his rank. Maybe it's like a file photo, a military ID or something. But more importantly, you get his rank insignia, whatever it is, is it stars, squares, squiggles, and shapes, whatever the One Piece world uses to denote its militariness. Whatever it is, it's on screen and Smoker grabs it, slams it on his shoulder or wherever the rank goes or something like that. Because the bounty thing works so well that I really think we should take that and really lean into that device and expand it further. Speaking of bounties, I really love how Luffy sees his first bounty in the live action. In the manga, it's fun because Nami berates a news coup for raising prices, classic big news Morgan greedy decision-making there. And then they see the bounty and it's a bit of fun, but that's kind of that. So I love that the bounty has a deeper meaning in the live action that goes all the way back to episode one, where Luffy wants nothing more than to be a pirate with his poster amongst everyone else's. Well, he does want something more. He wants to be the pirate king, but still milestones. So Kobe sees the poster. He knows how much it means and decides to personally deliver it to his friend and rival. And it ends up hitting Luffy so much harder in the live action than it did in the manga. It actually reminds me a bit of Mihawk visiting Shanks with Luffy's bounty. They're old rivals, but Mihawk knows how much this means to Shanks. So he goes out of his way to do it. But when it comes to Kobe, Alvida's actress recently posted an image on old Twitter, which I retweeted saying, Kobe made a mistake. And a lot of you liked that, like a lot of you. And then things got a bit weird because there's thirsty and then there's whatever that thread turned into. But Alvida is a shocking improvement over the original. Alvida is a throwaway character in both the anime and the manga. She's a bit of a relic and existed in the time before Oda really knew how to recycle his old villains. Although to be fair, many villains in East Blue don't get reused at all. So alvida has got that going for her. In fact, she's one of the oldest, most enduring characters in all of One Piece because a thousand plus chapters later in 1058, you can see her here now as a member of Cross Guild. So imagine that Alvida is now an officer of an emperor of the sea. But despite her persistence, she's still, well, she's still kind of nothing. And I really love the energy that live action Alvida brought to the character. And I think that she would be a much more fun recurring character to keep seeing pop up. In the manga, once Alvida eats the devil fruit, she becomes very bland. She mostly sits or stands with all these neutral expressions and feels a lot more like set dressing for whenever Buggy's crew are relevant. I feel a bit bad because Buggy was done incredibly well, but I can't bring myself to say that the live action Buggy was better because it is just impossible to live up to the standards of the genius jester. Something that the live action did live up to though was correcting a long standing error with the anime because something that really irks manga fans is that Zeph severed his own leg and ate it to survive on the outcrop. That's what happened in the manga. But as soon as you say that in any online forum, someone who only watched the anime will immediately, um, actually you, with quite frankly, the confidence of an informed person. Um, actually, Zeph lost his leg in the water, saving Snanji. And I get why the anime changed it because severing and eating one's leg is a little bit brutal for Sunday morning television. But it's one of those times where you can tell that the people behind the live action really are One Piece fans 
OnlyFans and aren't just adapting it as another TV gig. So I could not have been more thrilled that the live action corrected the record. And there was a similar thing with Luffy stabbing himself in the eye. I actually didn't think that they would do this in the live action because it's a bit of a rough ask, child self-harming and everything. So much so that the One Piece anime also originally cut it out. And as a result, many anime only watchers still don't know how Luffy actually got his scar. But along with Zeph's no doubt nourishing severed leg, something else the live action went above and beyond with was the Baratier restaurant in general. Baratier might be one of the coolest sets I've ever seen in, 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 in anything. Putting the bar in the mouth of the fish was a stroke of genius, plus I love the colors. The rich reds, the golds, the lovely aqua glow. The atmosphere is bang on. Kilometers or even miles better than the original for our American viewers. It really does feel like you're in a fancy three Michelin star restaurant. And I would be very disappointed if they didn't repurpose the set and actually open a restaurant in South Africa. And if they did, I would eagerly fly across the world just for that. I think they did a great job with East Blue scenery in general. Although this one can be argued either way. East Blue is very aesthetically bland in one piece, which I think does work well because it grounds you in some form of reality before going really wild in the Grand Line. And the live action does a mostly great job of being striking from the get-go. Like instead of a kind of stock standard boring orange town, we had the setting of Buggy Spiegel Tent, which I am a big fan of. As I've said elsewhere before, I'm also a huge fan of Kaya's mansion and the horror atmosphere that they gave that. And the only one I don't think does a particularly great job is Arlong Park. The twisted theme park idea, it's really cool, but it doesn't seem as immersive and fleshed out as it could have been. Otherwise, they did a great job of making the East Blue locations actually memorable. When it comes to East Blue, the characters are memorable, the locations are not. So in lieu of not being able to focus on all of those great characters, which is unfortunate, at the very least, we made the locations pretty damn cool. But two of the rare characters who did get some improved focus were Sham and Butchie. It may have come at the cost of Django, but in the live action, these two are actual characters with some sort of established relationship. Whereas in the original, when it comes to the Meow Band brothers, I don't remember a single thing about them personality-wise. And I don't know how many times I've reread or rewatched One Piece. It's lots, the number is lots. But even with all of the lots, I don't really remember anything about them. And that's probably because there's not really anything to them. But in the live action, they have this fun bickering back and forth. They don't necessarily like each other, but out of loyalty or more likely fear of Kuro, they understand that they need to work together. Quite frankly, it's more than Sham and Butchie deserve. The effect of which inspired someone to post this in my comments. I want Sham to be the mother of my children. And I would say, be careful what you wish for, or at the very least specify live action Sham during your wish. To be fair, maybe you're referring to manga Sham. And either way, who am I to judge? But the Meow Band brothers were nowhere near the most minor characters to be done far, far too much justice, because that honor belongs to Mr. Seven. And not just any Mr. Seven either, the original Mr. Seven, who has never been depicted in One Piece outside of this single hastily drawn sketch in an SBS segment. In retrospect, Etchira Oda definitely did not realize the power that he held back in the day. Because we're now at a point in human history where his goofy throwaway sketches are becoming fully realized live action characters in one of the most expensive television series ever produced. And I really liked actually seeing this event with Zoro playing out. One common complaint I often hear about One Piece is all of the fights getting off screen because One Piece counterintuitively often tells rather than shows. For example, Kuzan versus Sakazuki. But in most cases it works because it builds the legend and the mystery and seeing the actual event would likely never live up to fan expectations. But then there's stuff like Zoro meeting Baroque works, which in the series feels a bit like a retcon. The sort of, oh yeah, you're the guys that I met, that I met off screen before the story started and before the author realized that you existed. And so inserting that into live action actually tightens the storytelling for the eventual Baroque works saga. And it also allows us to hear the line of, if they were that serious, then they should have sent someone better than Seven. So this isn't the fault of the anime or the manga because there is no way that they could have known what the future is. But the live action world feels so incredibly well integrated for weirdos, weirdos like me, who stop and examine all the details. Stuff like there are crates in the series that have been shipped from Water 7, various tools from the Galila company. There's also a newspaper in town where the headline is the death of Victoria Sindri, who is the actress that Dr. Hogback was obsessed with and eventually used her body to turn into a zombie. There's also at least two Panda Man sightings, one hedge in Kaya's garden and one in the Lion Nolan storybook. There's even references that longtime manga fanatics probably won't see or understand. Like this article saying that war continues on Broccoli Island, which post time skip is the island where we meet Ichiji and Niji as the Vin Smokes were contracted to finally end the war. So everything, everything feels connected. This world, it feels like it's moving regardless of whatever the Straw Hats are doing. It's a very living, breathing world. And even though a lot of it probably won't pay off even in the best case scenario for the live action, it's still an absolute gold mine should you desire to go digging. But let me know in the 
comments. What do you think that the live action did better than the manga or the anime?